Lord Jesus, we are here this morning because we want to praise you. We want to worship you. We want to lift up our voice to you because you are so worthy of our praise. We want to thank you for all that you do. And we want to thank you for the, for the continuous blessings that you reign in our lives. So we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. them on the road. The crowds then went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. We continue to praise our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue to worship him this morning and cry out Hosanna, our God who saves.
Come on, Calvary South Bay, you can do better than that. Good job, guys. Oh, Jesus, there's a reason you tell us to come to you as a child. We're thankful for unashamed praise. We're thankful for our kids. And Lord, we just pray that as we celebrate you today, what a great example of what it was, must have been over 2,000 years ago when they shouted Hosanna in the streets. Lord, we give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, 1030. How we doing? Great to see you this morning. We're going to be in two areas of Scripture, same book, different chapters. We are going to be in uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, and then just a few pages to the right, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23. Once again, Matthew 15, Matthew 23. Now, I need to tell you a story because some of you still have these left. We caught you. This week, I came out of just my one person, and I took 15 with me, and I um, wrote some new people's names to, from Chet, hope to see you. And I had quite an experience this week. I actually gave one to someone, and when I gave it to her, and she turned and saw her name, she actually got like a little emotional. And she goes, you wrote my name on here. This is like a personal invite. And I was like, I'm personally inviting you. Like this, she goes, this is your handwriting. And it was amazing to me how just taking a moment to write someone's name and then from Chet, how it like radically impacted. And she looked at me, she goes, I'm going to be there because you personally invited me. And I just thought to myself, wow, that is awesome. So listen, if these are hiding in the glove box of your car, <laughs> it's time to take them out, write someone's name. Now listen, let's say you don't know the person. Ask them their name. Hey, what's your name? Well, my name's John. Well, to John from Chet. And then just give it to them. Let me tell you something. That personal touch is going to cause them to want to come. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I want to let you see something. All right, here we go. When you see this on me, I will be in the dunk tank. Yes. We are going to have a dunk tank, and I'm going to have a baptism by fire. And if some of you are led by the devil to put me in the water, <laughs> God bless you. Um, and the reason why I'm letting you know is there are two different services on Easter at Dignity Health. There's a 6 a.m. sunrise service. Then we've got like a little halftime experience. There's going to be concerts. There's going to be face painting and balloons and all kinds of things. There's even going to be a dunk tank, and your pastor is going to be in there. Now listen, like I said, if the enemy leads you to put me in the water... If you just feel so let to make sure that I get wet before the next service, God bless you. Um, someone shouted out in the first service, like, hey, man. I was like, whoa, watching for you when you come. All right, so listen, this is my shirt. You're going to see this in me. And then the 830 service. Now, some of you are like, why the 830? Well, we didn't want a lot of time in between the two services. But can I tell you, 11 o'clock is hot. So the reason we're doing 8.30, 10.30, listen up. 10.30, do you hear me? The reason we're doing 8.30 is because it's cooler at 10 than it is at 11. So we wanted to, you to have an enjoyable experience on Easter, not a like blazing hot experience. We wanted you to feel the cool of heaven, not the hot of Hades. And so that is kind of our hope. So listen, 10.30 service, what time does it begin on Easter? Okay, there are two services. There's a 6 a.m. and a... And you can be that both because there's two completely different services. But 10.30, listen. You're going to have to wake up early on Easter. Do you hear me? Don't be like the 12.30 that shows up at 1. Do you hear me? It starts at 8.30. And listen... This is a sacrifice. Can I remind you of Calvary? Amen? Amen? So getting up a little early on Easter will bless the Lord. Amen. 
this is like the early morning section. That's like the, okay, we'll pray about this, Pastor Chuck. <laughs> All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer to prepare our hearts for the word. Our Father, we come before you this morning. And as we stop and think about this event over 2,000 years ago, we're overwhelmed by a remnant of people in the midst of so much darkness who desired to praise you. And we come before you now, Lord, because your desire is that we would be that remnant in the midst of darkness to praise you. But there's a character that you demand from your people. Be holy, for I am holy. And oftentimes we fall short of that. And so, Lord, as we listen, I pray that you would give us ears to hear. That you would cause your spirit to be even begin now evaluating our own hearts. Spirit, would you move in this place? In Jesus' name, amen. The events of Palm Sunday are well recorded in all four Gospels. And with all four accounts, we actually get a very vivid picture of a multitude of people shouting in the streets of Jerusalem, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest. They were waving palm branches as a sign of victory. Shouts. The shouts were for the coronation of their king coming down in the streets of Jerusalem. And in some sense, the disciples... They tried to orchestrate an event forcing Jesus to accomplish their will for him to be king now. But we all know that Jesus was the conductor of this orchestra. And Jesus was orchestrating this event. He was going to fulfill what the prophet Daniel had written over 480 years before this day. You remember? It's the prophecy of Daniel 9 of Daniel's 70 weeks. In fact, within that prophecy, he prophesied the exact date that Jesus would come into Jerusalem. It would be exactly 483 years from the time that Cyrus announced the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And 483 years after that announcement, the time had come. It was the specific day. This was not a measure of faith. This was actually just math. And Jesus comes walking in. He told the disciples to get a donkey. He was the conductor of this event. Because Zechariah revealed that he would come riding in on a donkey. You remember the scripture in Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly riding on a donkey. Jesus had told them three times, three times that he was going to die. But John, the apostle in his gospel, he humbly admits they just didn't get it. And even after this, he told them a story, a story that we've studied and I want to remind you of, that the kingdom of God would not appear immediately. It's actually found in Luke's gospel, chapter 19. It's a certain nobleman, he said, went into a far country to receive a, a kingdom for himself, and then he would return. Well, we know in this story, Jesus is the king of kings. So he called 10 of his servants, his disciples were his servants, and he delivered to them 10 minus. And he gave every single one of them 10 minus, and he said to them, do business till I come. Now, if you don't know, a mina is worth 100 denarii. And a denarii was one day's work. He basically gave them in one mina three months' wages. This was a lot of wealth for them to receive because we as his servants have received the wealth of the gospel. And he tells the church, do business till I come. You have a responsibility. But his citizens, as the story goes on, his citizens hated him. 
And they sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And as we studied before, we know that those citizens were the Jews. And though the crowds were shouting, Hosanna, there was something else that was happening that day. Because this event has greater significance. This Palm Sunday, this triumphant entry, it has a greater significance than the moment of praise in Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago. You see, just as Joseph's brothers sold him for 30 pieces of silver was a foreshadow of Judas's betrayal. And just as Jesus told the story of Jonah and how he was in the belly of a whale for three days would be a foreshadow of Jesus being in the belly of the earth for three days. This event, this Palm Sunday, oh, was not just about the event that happened 2,000 years ago. This event is a foreshadowing of a greater event that will happen in history. We know it as the second coming of Christ. You see, though there was an outward display of emotional praise, this couldn't have been the fulfillment of the prophecy because there was an underbelly of corruption. The underbelly was not visible or seen, but filled with rebellion and rejection in the dark corners of Jerusalem as the Sanhedrin met on figuring out how to kill Jesus. It was a source of decay and corruption. It was so much a source of corruption that it would cause this crowd shouting praises to God to be silenced as others would shout crucify him only a few days later. It was an inward corruption of the heart. Matthew chapter 15, Jesus speaks about the heart. And he speaks about this dark area of the heart. And as we read Mark chapter 15, could you just stop for a moment and maybe listen to Jesus speak to each one of us? Matthew chapter 15, I'll pick it up there in verse 17. He says, do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? In other words, it's not what you eat. It's not the washing of hands. It's not what you put in your stomach that makes you defiled. No, there's something else that defiles us. Take a look, if you would, at verse 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Anyone ever have an evil thought? Hello? Anyone ever have an evil thought? Let me just say one word, two words, your boss. Anyone ever have an evil thought? (laughs) Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Take a look at this. For out of the heart proceed murders. Anyone ever murder? Oh, you might say no, but Jesus relates murder to anger. Anyone ever been angry? Have you ever been angry? For out of the heart proceed adulteries. Anyone ever commit adultery? Oh, wait, don't answer. Not publicly. (laughs) This is a spiritual word that Jesus relates to him. And he tells Israel, you committed adultery because you made other things more important than me. And sometimes in our culture, our phones are more the idol than God is in our life. Adulteries. What about fornications? For out of the heart proceed fornication. This is a perverted way of what God intended as intimacy between a man and a woman. And have we perverted our relationship with God by making it something that it's not and telling God, this is the way I'm going to live my life. I'm going to rebel against the way that you're telling me to live my life. For out of the heart proceed thefts. Have you ever stolen from God? Not me, pastor. I'm not like those people that take the Bibles and put them in their trunk. I've never taken anything from God. What about your tithes and offerings? Is your money your money or you were steward of what God has given you? 
He says, for out of the heart proceed not just thefts, but fault witness. Have you ever told a lie? Hello? <laughs> Have you ever told a lie? Yes. Have your fish ever been this big? <laughs> Have you ever exaggerated? Have you ever said something to embellish the truth? What about blasphemies? These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Jesus knew there was an underbelly because Jesus knows all things, even knows all things about you. Do you remember what he told Nathaniel? In John chapter 1, he said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. He knows everything everything. There is nothing hidden from his sight, even the dark corners of your own heart. And it's amazing that we drag him into those secret places of our life when he told us there should only be three secrets in our life, our giving, our praying, and our fasting. Those are the only three secrets that any Christian should have. While all other secrets, even dark secrets, are known by him, his heart is that the only secrets would be our relationship with him in our giving, in our praying, in our fasting. What dark places do you think he does not know, but he says, I see you? John, who knew him so intimately as the disciple Jesus loved, he said of Jesus, no one needed to tell him about human nature, for he knew what was in each person's heart. It's John chapter 2, verse 25. Truly, this event 2,000 years ago when they were shouting in the streets could only be a foreshadow of a future event whereby the king of kings is praised by all of Zion and all of Jerusalem. Corruption had tainted the prophetic scriptures and Jesus knew it. For at this event, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 19 that when Jesus was coming into the city in Luke 19.41, the Bible says he wept over Jerusalem. And there's a reason why. Turn with me if to a few pages to the right that you might see Matthew chapter 23 and might you note even a different tone in my heart, even a different tone in my words. It's Matthew chapter 23. Would you look at verse 37? Listen to the heartbreak of the Savior only a few days after they shouted in the streets, Hosanna, Hosanna, now listen to our Savior. O Jerusalem, verse 37, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wait a second, Jesus, they'd already said this. Why are you telling them that they need to say it again? Because what happened in Jerusalem was a foreshadow of a future event where Jesus will come a second time. It was only a few days ago that in the Passion Week the crowd shouted, Hosanna! But Jesus reveals his heart now to the disciples. Listen, church. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, Chet, Chet. Oh, John, John. Oh, Sally, Sally. Can you hear the heart of our Savior? This place that God had placed his holy name, Jerusalem, had become a city of corruption. Standing outside the temple when he makes this statement, Jesus made it very clear that this house of prayer had become a den of robbers and thieves. His people filled with inward corruption, hypocrisy, and sin, now causing grief. He shouts out, Oh, Jerusalem! Oh, Chet! Oh, John! Oh, Pam! Oh, Sally! He calls out to his people. 
Jerusalem, according to the psalmist, was to be the joy of the whole earth. It has now become the thing that's grieving God's heart. And would you look why? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he says, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. I find it amazing of all the sins that Jerusalem had committed, Jesus articulated what grieved him most. That the ones that were sent to Jerusalem to deliver them and to bring them peace and to save them, they killed and they stoned. Can you hear the passion for relationship like none other from Jesus that they rejected his plea to make it right with God? This was his passion. I want to be in relationship with you. It's his ultimate desire to be in the relationship that he desires with his people. And he even warned them of impending judgment. But they continue to press on in their sin. And after sending all the prophets, God the Father then sends his one and only son. He's relentlessly pursuing his people as he's relentlessly pursuing you. These are the citizens. These are the ones that rejected the king. These are the ones in the story that rebelled against him. These are the ones who outwardly looked the part, but inwardly were filled with corruption. He pleaded with them, would you repent? And they refused, just like Bethsaida, just like Chorazin, just like Capernaum. All the miracles that Jesus did in those cities, he says, Everything that I did in you, but you refuse to change. You refuse to repent. You refuse to return to God. Listen to the heart of our Savior crying out for relationship. But I need you to see who he grieves for. And this is important, Christian. He grieves for the vilest of sinners. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. You ever been hit by a stone? It is the most gruesome way to die. Stone after stone that is pelting you. And the anger and the rage that the Jews must have had to stone someone to death, God's messenger, the vilest of sinners, murderers, those who killed. These are the ones that he's grieving over the great love of God. I find it hard to find pity for a murderer. I find it difficult. I think to myself, you deserve to go to jail. But listen to the heart of our Savior, to the vilest of sinners. Oh, Jerusalem, you murderers. Think of it for just for a moment. Because the enemy would have us think that we've gone too far. Satan would convince unbelievers and believers alike that even God couldn't forgive what you've done. That's the ploy of the enemy. You see, whether you have not known him or you are a backsliding Christian, listen to the heart of our Savior. He's calling your name. He's grieving for you. And there's nothing that you have done that will separate you from the love of God. There's nothing. In fact, do you remember when Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi? He asked them, who do people say that I am? And one of the disciples say, some say you're Jeremiah. Do you know who Jeremiah was? Jeremiah was the weeping prophet over backsliding Israel. Jesus, some believe you're a weeping prophet and you're so grieved about your backsliding people, people that call themselves by your name but are not living the life that honors you. They think you're Jeremiah. This is the heart of our Savior. He says, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Have you ever seen it? All she does is go, buck, 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 and they come running. A friend of mine came to me after the first service, and she goes, most of these people have, have never seen a live chicken. 
They have no idea. We need to take them to a third world country so they can see chickens call their chicks all day long. (laughs) Do you hear the tenderness of the Savior? Do you hear his passion to seek those who are lost and those that are drifting out of relationship with him? He says, I wanted to gather you. I'm not forced to. I wanted relationship with you. I wasn't forced to go to the cross. He actually wants, it's his greatest desire and his greatest grief. He wants to be in relationship with you. His sacrifice for your life was by his choice because he loves you. Church, he loves you, not just the world. He's beckoning us in Jeremiah chapter 31. So many people say that the God of the Old Testament seems so hard. But listen to the soft heart of God. In Jeremiah 31, he says this, I have loved you. He's speaking to his people. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I am drawing you. God is drawing you today. And there's a promise that he has for you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Let me tell you about Mama Hen. Let me tell you a story about Mama Hen. When the hen sees the bird of prey hovering over in the sky, when she sees the danger, she beckons the chicks. Do you know that there is an enemy hovering over Calvary Chapel South Bay? And his goal is to kill His goal is to steal and to destroy. And as soon as Mama Hen sees the enemy, sees the bird of prey hovering over her chicks, she makes one little cluck and all of the little ones come running underneath her. Do you know what Jesus is saying? He's saying that chicks are smarter than human beings. That's what he's saying. They recognize loving authority and they respond when they've wandered. That's what Jesus is saying. And in Psalm chapter 91 verse 4, the Bible makes it very clear he will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. You see, is it possible that God's calling you today? to cover over you from the enemy that's trying to kill, steal, and destroy your life with sin? Do you feel the heat of the day, and do you need the protection of Jesus? In Malachi chapter 4, when you run under the shelter of his wings, listen to the promise of Scripture. The Bible tells us in Malachi chapter 4 that under his wings is healing. You see, sin is an inward corruption. It's a sickness. It's a corrosive cancer. And he says, if you'll just run to me when I call your voice, when you hear your name, you're going to find mercy and you're going to be healed. Can I tell you something about his voice? His offer is free, but it cost him everything on Calvary's tree. His offer beckons us every day by his spirit who convicts the world of sin and convicts the believer of unrighteousness. And his offer is true. And let me tell you why it's true. Because he said it. He said that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from not some unrighteousness, but all unrighteousness. And he's beckoning us today to repent. Repent's not a very 21st century friendly word, is it? We like kumbaya Jesus. We don't want repent Jesus. (laughs) Repent Jesus has like, you know, makes people feel uncomfortable. That means people have to change. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Is he calling your name today? Unfortunately, Jesus goes on in our text and in Matthew 23, 37, he says, I was wanting but you were not willing. Can I tell you then and now, this was and is the foundation of the grief of Jesus when we are not willing to repent. When we choose the temporary over the eternal. When we choose the physical over the spiritual like Esau. 
when we choose the passing pleasure of sin instead of the narrow road of righteousness. Oh, that we would hear the plea of our Savior and him calling your name. He is willing. Are you wanting? Will you run? And in Matthew chapter 23, verse 38, knowing that they would not repent, he says, see, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say. Now remember, this is days after the triumphant entry. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowds have already shouted it. Jesus, why are you saying it again? Well, I need to take you all the way back to Psalm 118 because that's where this particular phrase comes from. Listen, save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. In the Hebrew, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Listen to what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 118. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Now, if you read the Gospels, not one of the Gospel writers included, we have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Because the house of the Lord of Jesus' day had rejected him. It was the streets of Jerusalem. It was the remnant of believers. It was like the church in a dark area that was shouting, Hosanna, in the midst of so much corruption. And the reason why they didn't include it is because they came to understand that Jesus was talking about his second coming. But now, as Jesus walks off of Temple Mount, he says, your house is left to you desolate because I'm God and I'm leaving the building. And this word desolate, I wonder if it describes your Christian life. Barren, dry, and void of life. Ichabod, an Old Testament word that means the glory of the Lord has departed. And when Jesus walked off of Temple Mount, the glory departed with him. You see, the gospel writers finally came to understand that the event that happened 2,000 years ago at his first coming it was not the fulfillment of Scripture. It was the foreshadow of his second coming when all of Zion and all of Jerusalem, there would be no corruption. For Jesus said, I will see you no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Zechariah tells us that this happens at his second coming when Jesus comes in the clouds and those who pierced him will look at him and mourn and the spirit of grace will be poured out upon him. Because let me tell you some truth about the Bible. There can be no revival without repentance. There can't be a revival without repentance. And judgment begins in the house of God. We cannot call the world to repentance if we're not willing to repent ourselves. But church, we don't need to wait for that time when every knee will bow, whether by force or by choice. Because one day every knee will bow, whether you want to or not. And in this age of grace, we have a chance to repent. And we should repent. Does your spiritual life feel desolate? Is it possible that there's dark areas of your own heart? Don't allow your sin to separate you from a relationship with God because that's his desire more than anything. He doesn't want to, to say, you shall see me no more. He wants to walk with you in the cool of the garden. Remember, when Adam sinned, it was God that said, where are you? And he's still seeking you today. He's seeking you. Church, be careful of the warning found in the New Testament today. If you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Beware lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelieving in departing from the living God. 
He's speaking about a time of Israel's history. There in Hebrews chapter 3, when the children of Israel were delivered from slavery, they went from death to life when they crossed through the Red Sea. They were baptized by the water. But then on the other side, they began to worship idols. Then on the other side, they began to blame God. They wanted what the world had to offer instead of the way of God. And the writer of Hebrews, he warns the church today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, there's a scripture that we all know. If my people, not the world, if my people who are called by my name, that's us, Christians, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. This Easter, we've called you to rise up because we believe, we believe that God has given us LA. We believe that there's going to be, re be revival. And we've been praying for God to heal our land, but it requires his people to get on their knees and repent. There cannot be revival if it does not begin with repentance. And you might be sitting there going, where are you going with this? Isaiah chapter 53. All we like sheep, that's God's people, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord, listen to what he's done, has laid the iniquity of all of us on him. He's our Savior. And he's calling your name and my name today. And he wants to gather us like a hen gathers her chicks to protect us, to warm us by the fire of his spirit, and to, protect, and to give us life and security. And maybe we need to follow the chicken's example. Because the Bible says, he who covers over his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. That's repentance, gang. When we confess and forsake the dark secret corners that exist in our life. In that, mercy can be found. Next Sunday, I'm gonna call the world to repentance. But judgment begins in the house of God. So today, I'm calling the church to repentance. We call this a holy week. Why don't we enter it in holiness? So I'm gonna get on my knees. And those of you that are physically able and are willing to join, would you go before with me as we humble ourselves on our knees, asking God to forgive us and to heal our land? Father, Calvary Chapel South Bay is your church, and we are your people. And I believe that you are calling us as a church to repentance. Forgive us for letting sin reign in LA. Forgive us for not letting our light so shine. Forgiving us for spending more time on our phone than we do in the word. Forgive us for that idolatry. Forgive us, Lord, for not being a great representation of you on earth. We come before you and we repent. 
we're confessing to you. And would you take just a moment and would you ask the Spirit of God to walk through the spirit of your life and expose any dark corner that may be there? And would you repent? Father, we come before you and we repent. Forgive us of our sin, cleanse us from unrighteousness and give us the power of your Holy Spirit to forsake sin, to not go back to it. The Bible says as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. We want to be wise, not foolish, Jesus. So on our knees, we come before you because we expect you to do great things. We believe you want to pour out your spirit of grace. And so your church bows before the King of Kings. We are those that shouted in the streets, though they didn't shout in the temple. We are those who cry out, Hosanna. And we trust you to save. So on our knees, Lord, we humble ourselves and ask, Would you heal our land? In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? Church, revival only comes when God's church is purified. And what just happened was a spiritual pouring out of God's spirit on all of us. When you walk out of here, don't let the devil lie to you. You've been cleansed. You are free. You're free. And let me tell you something about Jesus. Those who the Son has set free, they're free indeed.